Hello everybody, welcome to this video looking at some applications of Taylor and Maclaurin series. So now we've understood what Taylor and Maclaurin series are, the ways to represent functions as power series, we want to put that knowledge to good use. So in this section, we're going to see several applications. We're going to look at um, finding sums, finding limits, computing integrals, computing high derivatives, and also how to just, just for extra fun, how to multiply power series. And then in the next section on its own, we'll look at how to use power series to approximate functions. So let's get started. And this is just a taster. There are many more applications that we, we're not even going to talk about. So first off, computing sums. So we said you know, sums, quite often we can figure out whether they converge or diverge. We have various tests, but only a few of the tests tell us what the sum actually converges to when it converges. So one thing we can do is we, if we know that a function is represented by a power series, we can think about it the other way as saying the power series equals the function. And if we can represent, if we, if we can figure out that some sum comes from a power series with a particular value of x, then we can just plug in that value of x in the function to evaluate the sum. So here, is, for instance, is an example. Let's find the sum from n equals zero to infinity of negative one to the n pi to the two n plus one of a four to the two n plus one, two n plus one factorial. And we see the negative one to the n and the two n plus one factorial kind of reminds us of sine x. So we know that sine x is the sum from n equals zero to infinity of negative one to the n of a two n plus one factorial times x to the two n plus one. So if we kind of stare at these two sums and compare them a little bit, um, the negative one to the n's are in both, the two n plus one factorial is in both. In the sine x, we have x to the two n plus one. In the sum above, we have pi to the two n plus one over four to the two n plus one. So this sum is actually the series for sine x with x equal to pi over four. So I can, I can get the series that we're trying to find the sum of just by taking the series for sine x and subbing in pi over four. So if I want to evaluate it, evaluate it this is going to be equal to sine of pi over four. So right, sine x is equal to this power series for any value of x in particular that they equal for pi for pi over four. And we actually know what pi of sine of pi over four is. It's root two over two or one over root two, it's equivalent. So this sum converges to root two over two. Uh, here, everything was kind of set up so that it worked nicely. It was just a, a just a series or a power series that we know already with a particular value of x. Sometimes you might want to also, or might need to do a little bit of algebra to play around with it, to put it in the right form. So for instance, let's look at this sum, negative one to the n pi to the two n plus one over three to the two n minus two, two n factorial. In this case, we're gonna to have to do some algebra and maybe pull out some factors or, or multiply by something in order to compare it to a series we know with a particular value of x. So we see here, we have the sum of negative one to the n divided by two n factorial. So now it reminds us a bit more of the sum for cosine of x. Cosine of x is the sum of negative one to the n over two n factorial times x to the two n. So we want to pull out a factor of pi and then do something with the three to the two n minus two. So it looks like pi to the two n divided by three to the two n. And then we can recognize it with, with cosine of pi over three or something like that. So if I, if I do that, we, that's where we're headed. I want to make these two powers two n so that I can compare it with the series for cosine of x. I claim it's equal to nine pi times the sum with pi to the two n divided by three to the two n. So let's just check that's equal to what we started with. If we bring in the pi, we get pi times pi to the two n gives us pi to the two n plus one. And then we have nine over three to the two n minus two. That's three squared over three to the two n minus two. If we divide top and bottom by three squared, it's the same as one over or, or, or no threes over three to the two n minus two. So if you just play around a little bit with the algebra, you'll see these are equal. And as we, as we said, cosine x is the sum of negative one to the n x to the two n over two n factorial. Now we can recognize the, this, the inner part of this sum it's the series for cosine of x with x replaced by pi over three, right? We have the two n factorials and we have pi over three all to the power of two n. But there was still the nine pi out in front. So it, the, the, the sum converges to nine pi times cosine of pi over three. Cosine of pi over three is a half, so we get nine pi over two. Okay, so to kind of summarize, one way to evaluate sums is to use power series we already know, recognize it as that series with a particular value of x, and then sub in the x value and the function instead, which is easier to evaluate using some other knowledge we have. And also we might have to you know, tweak these things by applying some kind of algebra to, to pull out factors and things like that. Okay, so let's see the next application. Next one is to apply limits. So for instance, let's use series to find the limit of e to the x minus one minus x divided by x squared. This one we could also use L'Hopital's rule to do and that would be perfectly fine. But it, it's gonna turn out there are some limits where applying L'Hopital's rule will be kind of a pain. Maybe we would have to differentiate many, many times or maybe the derivatives will be kind of difficult. So it's useful also to be able to do it using Taylor or Maclaurin series. So let's see how to do it. And basically the idea is just to replace e to the x by its Maclaurin series and then try to cancel any terms and take the limit. So we know that e to x is the sum of x to the n over n factorial. 
So we're going to replace e to the x by its series. So 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 plus x cubed over 3 factorial, x to the 4 over 4 factorial, and so on. So all the, all the terms are here. And then we have minus 1 minus x divided by x squared. And then we look at what we can cancel. So there is a 1 and a minus 1 and an x and a minus x. So we're just left with x squared over 2 factorial, x cubed over 3 factorial, and so on, those higher terms. And this is all divided by x squared. So we can just divide each term by x squared. Remember, we can split a fraction along the top, but we can never split it along the bottom. So splitting along the top is OK. We just divide each term by x squared. We get 1 over 2 factorial, or 1 half, plus x over 3 factorial, plus x squared over 4 factorial, and so on. And now we let x go to 0, because we simplified as much as we can. And now the good news is that we don't anymore have 0 over 0 or anything like that. That was, that was the problem uh, back at the start. If we just tried to sub in naively x equals 0, we would have had 1 minus 1 minus 0. We would have had 0 divided by 0. There's no way to make sense of that. So now we have something where we can just plug in as x goes to 0. We get a half, and then all the rest of the terms are 0. So the limit here is going to be a half. And uh, since I'm a pure mathematician, I want to justify you know, why was it OK to plug in x equals 0 here. Uh, so remember that we can the, the limits where we can just plug in to find the limit are continuous functions. So we said power series are differentiable within their radius of convergence, and differentiable implies continuous. So we're using the fact that power series are, are continuous, at least within their radius of convergence. Maybe not the endpoints, but if, if we're within the interval. So we can just find the limit by plugging in x equals 0. OK, so this is one kind of application. Finding limits, we basically replace the complicated function by, the, by its Maclaurin series or its, or its Taylor series. We simplify as much as we can, maybe cancel some terms, divide some terms, um, and then we plug in to find the limit. OK, next up, finding integrals. So we kind of touched on this a little bit before when we had the representation for 1 over 1 minus x. It's the same kind of story. So for instance, suppose we want to integrate e to the minus x squared as, as a power series. So I, I think, as I mentioned before, this series, this kind of integral is important because it's related to the normal distribution, which comes up in probability and statistics. But there is no nice way to find an antiderivative of e to the minus x squared in terms of elementary functions that we're used to. So you need some other way to do it numerically or with power series. So that's what we're doing. So the first step is to find a series for e to the negative x squared. And fortunately, we know a series for e to the x. e to the x is just the sum of x to the n of n factorial. And then we're using the same kind of algebra or differentiation or integration tricks that we had before to find a series for e to the minus x squared. We just replace x by negative x squared. So replacing x by negative x squared everywhere, we get e to the negative x squared is the sum of negative x squared to the n, all divided by n factorial. And then I have negative x squared to the n. I get negative 1 to the n times x squared all to the n. x squared all to the n, we multiply the, the powers, is going to give us x to the 2n. So we found a represent, representation for e to the negative x squared. And now we just have to integrate both sides. And remember, we said that to integrate a power series, we can just integrate term by term. So the integral of e to the negative x squared, it's going to be the sum where we integrate term by term. We're integrating with respect to x. So the negative 1 to the n and the n factorial don't do anything. They're just constant multipliers. They, they, stay, they just stay there. And we integrate the x to the 2n. We get x to the 2n plus 1 divided by 2n plus 1 just using the power, the power of the exponent pool. OK, and then since it's an it's a indefinite integral, we want to add on the plus c. So plus c. So it was relatively easy to find this other power series. And then you know, if you want to compute this, compute some definite integrals or something like this, you will plug in the limits and then do some kind of approximation like we've seen to find the, to approximate the series. OK, so this was another application finding integrals. We just find a series for the next thing we're trying to integrate, and then we integrate time by time. OK, and then lastly, uh, or, or maybe almost coming towards the end, finding higher order derivatives is something that's a little bit less obvious. So let's see. Let's, let's remember back to what was the, the connection between the coefficients of the Taylor series and the derivatives of the function. So we said that if a function can be given by a power series centered at a, then there is only one thing it can be. It's the thing that we call the Taylor series centered at a, and the coefficients were given by fn of a divided by n factorial. So the nth derivative at a over n factorial. And thinking about it this way, if we wanted to find the Taylor series of a function, we needed to start off by finding all the derivatives of the function and then plugging them in, in the formula, and then that gave us the Taylor series. But sometimes we might be able to find a Taylor series another way. Maybe we start with a Taylor series we already know, and then we do these algebra or differentiation or integration techniques, and we get a Taylor series for a new function, like with e to the negative x squared that we just saw. So sometimes we might not have to do this process. We might find the Taylor series some, some other way. And then we can kind of use this and go backwards to find high derivatives of the function using the Taylor series. So if I want to turn this formula around, I could multiply both sides by n factorial. That gives me the nth derivative at a is equal to n factorial times cn. 
And then I want to remember what CN was. CN was the coefficient of x minus a to the n in the Taylor series. So this, this formula, I think, is, is useful to keep in mind or write on a formula sheet, maybe. The nth derivative at a is n factorial times the coefficient of x minus a, a to the n in the Taylor series. So let's see an example of how this works. So for example, let f of x be x cubed e to the 2x. Let's try to find the 100th derivative at 0. And you could maybe just start differentiating, find f prime and f double prime, and maybe there will be a pattern, or maybe it will be kind of hard to recognize. Uh, so it looks like quite a challenging problem. But it's easier if we just start off by finding the, the Maclaurin series for x cubed e to the 2x. So since we're finding the derivatives at 0, well, we should look at the series, which is centered at 0. So we're going to look for the Taylor series centered at 0, the Maclaurin series. So it's easier if we start off by finding the Maclaurin series for x cubed e to the 2x, and then we use the formula that we had on the previous slide. So to do that, let's start with our series for e to the x. So e to the x is the sum of x to the n of n factorial. Replace all the x's by 2x. We get the sum of 2 to the n, x to the n of n factorial. And then we multiply by x cubed. That's going to give us a sum, a series for x cubed e to the 2x. It's uh, 2 to the n. And then since we're multiplying by x cubed, we have x to the n plus 3 over n factorial for every x. And now we said since once a function is represented as a power series with a particular center, there's only one way to do it. It's the Maclaurin series or the Taylor series, depending on the center. So this is necessarily the Maclaurin series for x cubed e to the 2x. If there's one way to write it as a series, it's, that's the only way you can do it. OK, so now we have the Maclaurin series for x cubed e to the 2x. We can go backwards and use our formula that was on the previous slide. We said the 100th derivative at 0 is 100 factorial times the coefficient of x to the 100 in the Maclaurin series. So we have to figure out where the term x to the 100 appears. So when do, when do we get 2 to the n, x to the n plus 3 of n factorial is going to give us a term that includes x to the 100. Well, x to the n plus 3 should be x to the 100. So n plus 3 should be 100. This happens when n is 97. So this is not n equals 100 in the sum. If I go ahead and plug in here n equals 100 in the sum, I'm going to get 2 to the 100, x to the 103 divided by 100 factorial. So then I will get an x to the 103 term. So this is a common mistake that people make. They just go ahead and plug in 100 in the sum. We are looking for when we get x to the 100. x to the 100 is when n plus 3 equals 100, or n equals 97. OK, so we figured out it happens when n equals 97. The term, which is the whole thing, is 2 to the 97. We're plugging in n equals 97. 2 to the 97, x to the 100 divided by 97 factorial. And then the coefficient is the part that does not include the x. It's the part that goes in front of the x to the 100. So the coefficient is 2 to the 97 divided by 97 factorial. And then we go back to our formula. The 100th derivative is 100 factorial times that coefficient. So we get 100 factorial times 2 to the 97 divided by 97 factorial. So this is pretty powerful when, when it works. Uh, you know, Definitely, it would have been a mess to start differentiating f and try to do it by brute force. So this was really useful. Uh, let me just say, say a warning one more time. So the x to, x to the k term does not always correspond to when n equals k in the sum. So here in this example, the x to the 100 term, we were looking for when the x to the 100 term appears in the Maclaurin series. This does not always happen when n equals 100 in the sum. If we just plugged in n equals 100, we would have got x to the 103. So we had to solve and find, x equal, find n equals 97. So if you don't understand this point, please do ask about it in class, because it's maybe the most, most common error in this, this type of problem. OK, so moving on to the last thing, let's talk about multiplying power series together. And fortunately, there's not too much to say. We just multiply power series kind of like polynomials, except we, we just focus on, say, the start, the, the first few terms. So for instance, let's try to find the first three non-zero terms in the Maclaurin series for e to the x sine x. If you wanted to compute the full thing, it would be a pain, and it's not something we need to, to care about. We're just going to be interested in finding the starting terms. So we just replace e to the x and sine x by the starting series. and we want to make sure that in each case we include enough terms so that we're gonna we're gonna have enough terms to find the first three non-zero terms. So let's start with one plus x plus x squared over two plus x cubed over six for the e to the x, and x minus x cubed over six for the sine x, and see where we get to. And then I'll talk a little bit in a second about how I chose uh, how how we should decide how many terms to pick. Okay, let's multiply this out. So just just like with polynomials, I take the one and I multiply it by everything that's over in the second bracket or parenthesis. So I have 1 times x, 1 times minus x cubed over 6 gives us x minus x cubed over 6. And then we take the x and multiply by each term. So we get x squared minus x to the 4 divided by 6. I take the x squared over 2 and I multiply by each term in the next bracket. 
we get x cubed over 2 minus x to the 5 divided by 12. And then so on with the x cubed over 6 is going to give us an x to the 4 over 6 minus x to the 6 over 36. And then there were lots of terms that weren't included just because it's an infinite series. After all, there would be an x to the 4 over 4 factorial term and then more terms in the, in the second one. So we just keep these as dot, dot, dot. And then we try to simplify what we have. So there were no constant terms. Then we look at where all the x terms are. OK, we got all the x terms. It's just x. We look at the x squared terms. There was only an x squared term. And then we look for the x cubed term. OK, we had negative x cubed over 6 plus x cubed over 2. OK, that's going to be negative 1 over 6 x cubed plus 3 over 6 x cubed. That's going to be 2 over 6 or 1 third x cubed. And then I omitted the rest. So why did I not care about the x to the 4, for instance? So here, this x to the 4, negative x to the 4 over 6 is not uh, the plus x to the 4 over 6 here. These are not very helpful because we didn't include enough terms at the beginning to guarantee that we had all the x to the 4 terms. So here, going back to the, the previous step, the next term here would have been an x to the 4 over 4 factorial. So because we didn't include that at the start, we might be missing some of the x to the 4 terms. Or there would have also been an x to the 5 over 5 factorial. We didn't include that at the start, so we might be missing some x to the 5 terms. So the kind of what I'm trying to say here is if you want to say, if, if you want to, to, to have, say, the x to the 4 term with accuracy, you need to, to include all the x to the 4 terms, or all the terms up to x to the 4 at the beginning. Or if you want to have an x to the k term at the end with accuracy, and you want to know you got the coefficient correct, then you want to make sure you included all the x to the k terms here at the beginning. OK, but looking at least up to the x cubed, in each series, we included up to x cubed. So we know that in the end, when, once we multiplied through, we got the x cubed term correct. So we, the first three non-zero terms in the product are going to be x plus x squared plus a third x cubed, and then the rest is just dot, dot, dot. If it had turned out some more, if these terms were zero, say the x term had been zero, and here I would have had x squared plus a third x cubed, then we would have had to look for the next term. So we would have had to look for the x to the 4 or the x to the 5 term. Then we would have had to go back and put in x to the 4 or x to the 5 in the first two terms. So you just kind of have to include enough terms in the product to, to, to what you think will be will give you enough terms. But if it turns out you didn't include enough terms at the beginning, then you'll want to go back and add some more in. OK, so let me just say again those things that I, I warned you about, which are common mistakes. So if we want to get the x to the k term correct for the product, we have to include all the terms up to x to the k at the start. And as I said here, if x to the 3 had not given us enough terms, say we were looking for three non-zero terms, if any of these had been 0, we would have had to go back to the beginning and include up to x to the 4 or up to x to the 5. But with those kind of caveats in mind, um, the multiplication itself is kind of like with polynomials. We just multiply each term by every other term. OK, that's it for this video. Thanks, everyone. See you next time.